Now, The Hunt Palmer Show. Yes! I feel like I've been waiting for this my entire life. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show on 104.5 ESPN, Baton Rouge. Jolly good fun. Jolly, jolly good. Locking down the middle of the day. America's favorite daytime fun show. Live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge studio, this is Hunt Palmer. Number two, Tuesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show, presented by Pluckers Wing Bar. Two locations here in Baton Rouge, Nicholson, just south of campus. Blue Bonnet in front of the mall of Louisiana. Pluckers, if you don't like our wings, we'll give you the bird. Fifteen minutes from right now, Denton Day, Sirius XM College Football Overtime. Talking college football national storylines, as well as his thoughts on LSU and Bama coming up this weekend. Sharif Ishak from Saints Land in 2.30 um, some Twitter rumblings, Carl Granderson's name being mentioned on the trade deadline streets. Uh, also, Chase Young, obviously a guy that that we may see some news on here over the next hour. If you missed the news of the day, Marshawn Lattimore uh, traded from the Saints to Washington. Saints get some draft capital and are officially restarting this thing from the ground up. So we'll see if anything else happens in the next 57 minutes before the NFL trade deadline hits. I um, want to talk some LSU Bama here at the top of our number two. Brian Kelly uh, met with the media yesterday, and he was going through the keys to beating Alabama, and I decided to take that answer and just trim it down to one key to beating Alabama, and that is, of course, you got to stop Jalen Milrose somehow, some way. Brian Kelly spoke about it. Defensively, you know, stopping the quarterback is, is going to be paramount. Milrose outstanding. He also can throw the football, so you know he is a dual threat. You know, I think first down is an important down as well. I mean, they're they're one of the best third down and short conversion teams in the country. We need to get them behind the chains. Milro is different than anyone else LSU has played. Um, I, I liken it to this, and this this works for some people, it doesn't work for other people, but. I feel like there are enough people that it does work for that's reasonable to talk about. Jalen Milrow plays quarterback like the create a player from your video game when you were 14. You get a big, fast, strong dude that has huge arm strength and can run away from safeties and run over linebackers. Like, there really weren't a lot of those in 1998 when I was playing my game, but Jalen Milrow is one of them. He is big. He is fast. He is strong. He can throw it a mile. And it is quite simply not a coincidence that in Alabama's best two offensive games of this season, which were at Wisconsin, a 42 to 10 win, and then against Georgia, a 41 to 34 win, in those two games, Jalen Milrow ran it 14 times for 75 yards against Wisconsin and 16 times for 117 against Georgia. He is an absolute problem running the football. And you don't have to just go back to this year to see that. You don't have to just look at their offensive performances against teams this year. You can go back to the LSU game last year, and you all remember it. It was nightmarish if you're LSU as far as Jalen Milrow running the football. He ran it 20 times, a season high, for 155 yards and four touchdowns. 20 carries, 155 yards, four touchdowns. He just destroyed LSU. And again, I'm not going to be your X's and O's guy every day, but it did seem evident that Milrow oftentimes was dropping back and LSU was playing man coverage and turning their back on him, and he was just tucking it and running. And there's 14 yards, and there's 26 yards, and there's 9 yards, and there's 6 yards, and there's 17 yards, and they just never appeared to do anything differently to stop him from running. Now, that was a different staff different group of personnel. And you have to imagine, after watching what we watched in College Station a week and a half ago when Marcel Reed came in and LSU looked like they had never seen a a a quarterback that could run, you would imagine that they've been looking at that and going, okay, well, we got to shore that up. And that's undoubtedly job number one for LSU. Yeah, you got to deal with Ryan Williams. Yeah, they've got two running backs that are running for better than six yards a carry. Yeah, they've got a big physical offensive line. It's got some guys that are going to be pros. Like, there's not just one aspect to this Alabama offense, but there is one aspect that's more important than the other aspects, and that is Jalen Milrow's ability to run the football. And LSU has to, has to, has to find a way 
to slow that down in some capacity. I don't feel like it's realistic for LSU to hold Jalen Milrow to 11 rushing yards. I, I don't think that's going to happen. He hasn't gone nuts in every game. You can certainly point to some games with some sack adjustments where he didn't run it well. Tennessee held him to 11 yards on 14 carries. South Carolina held him to 36 yards on 18 carries. Now, he had two touchdowns there. Vanderbilt held him to 10 yards on seven carries. Heck, South Florida, 12 carries for two yards. But you got sack yardage there, and I feel like there's going to be a real insistence by Alabama to make sure that he runs. And LSU has to be ready for it. Brian Kelly talked about defending Milrow in a Kalen DeBoer offense as opposed to what he saw last year in the offense under Nick Saban and Tommy Reese. Last year, Matt, it was evolving. Like, I don't know that they knew what they wanted to do because it was a quarterback controversy. They were kind of playing multiple quarterbacks last year at Alabama. I think they had two or three quarterbacks going back and forth. Then they kind of settled on Milrow just before they got to us. And it was big chunk play. You know, it was run the quarterback. Here, they've had all spring, and they've settled on a system with a starting quarterback. So it's consistency week in and week out. They're doing the same thing with him week in and week out. So you, there's a comfort level within the offense. When we got to him last year, you weren't really sure what you were going to get. It was a little bit of everything. I know that conventional wisdom and Joe Watercooler football fan, and myself is included in that at times, uh, so, so just put a spy on him. Just just spy him. And that sounds great. And I don't think LSU is going to come into this game with no spy package that they've got. But it's easier said than done to spy him and then go get him in the open field. Like, Whit Weeks is a good athlete. Physical guy. Can probably run with Jalen Milrow to an extent. But it's hard to stand eight yards from him, wait for him to go, and then watch him take off and then make sure you go and, and make that play. He's made a, a two-and-a-half-year career out of running by guys and making guys miss. And he certainly did that against LSU last year, although I didn't see a spy on him a ton. But you got to figure Alabama's going to come out with a read option package with Jam Miller and with... Jalen Milrow, and they're going to start there. And if LSU doesn't prove they can stop it, well, it's just going to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. If LSU does make some adjustments and, and stops that, I think you're still going to see Milrow run, especially when he drops back and maybe nothing's quite there. Take off, and it's just tough to stop him. Now, it's happened some, but I think there's a lot of LSU fans that would look back at that game in College Station a little bit of PCSD and be like, I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. Milrow is an average player through the air. He's not terrible. He's certainly not polished. He's certainly not elite. He's an average passer. He's pretty good, generally speaking, on the deep ball. He can be erratic on the intermediate stuff. I thought he looked bad against Missouri. 62% completion, no touchdowns, no picks. Um, 215 yards. He got sacked twice. I thought he was mediocre against Tennessee, who probably has the best defense in the league. 56% completion, two interceptions and a touchdown. One statistic absolutely to look at here, though, is those interceptions. Two against Tennessee, two against South Carolina, one against Vanderbilt, one against Georgia. There was a run there of four straight games where he had one. He did not against Missouri. But LSU probably needs to force a turnover or two from Jalen Milrow. I think you've got a better chance of getting your hands on a couple of those errant passes, whether he sails one over the middle or he's late on a read or any of the things that, that can plague a quarterback who's not elite through the air, which Milrow is not. If you've got an opportunity to get your hands on it, you've got to get your hands on it. They did that against Jackson Dart in a couple of crucial spots. That's got to happen again. So it's, it's a lot to ask. Spy him, get him on the ground, hold that rushing offense, spearheaded by the quarterback down, and then, hey, when he throws you a pick, you got to make a pick. And these are all easy things to diagnose, but when you've watched Alabama play for the last two years, like most of us have, you've seen all this far too often. Like, we haven't seen enough Marcel Reed to make real judgments on what he should or shouldn't have been against LSU on Saturday night. 
But we've seen enough of Jalen Milrow to know he wants to run. He is erratic, and you've got to intercept the ball when he throws it to you. Look at Tennessee. They did it. You look at South Carolina. They did it. You look at Vanderbilt. They did it. They were in games or won games. You look at Wisconsin. Didn't stop him on the ground. And didn't have an interception. Well, they gave up 42 points and lost. That's the way you've got to play this with Jalen Milrow. He's going to make some plays. You got to limit them and make plays of your own on the other end. It's a tough, tough matchup for LSU. Jalen Milrow is a heck of a football player. Uh, we'll see him inside Tiger Stadium on Saturday night. If you're looking for LSU football content all week long, all season long, all year long, Hunt on LSU is our LSU football YouTube channel. And of course, there's lots of LSU content up at this moment at LouisianaSports.net. A lot of Saints content up as well. We'll talk Saints with Sharif Ishaq coming up in about 15 minutes. When we come back, Denton Day, college football overtime, talking CFB. It's the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Evolve physical therapy and sports. Evolve physical therapy Involve PT.com, I should say. Uh, look, if you're in pain, that sucks. But there are folks here that can deal with it for you. Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports is happy to help you get rid of that pain and get back to being your active self. Whether it's elbow pain, knee pain, back pain, hip pain, wrist pain, neck pain. No matter how you got it. Car accident, injured playing sports, slept on it wrong, old age creeping up on you. Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports, happy to help you. They do... Dry needling, they do cupping, they do scraping, they've got isokinetic testing to mess, uh, measure the recovery of your muscles as you rehabilitate. Don't settle for some subpar physical therapy experience. Go to the hands-on team at Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports. Robbie Bolton and his team are the best. They're on uh, starring near Highland Road, right behind Sammy's Grill. It's Evolve Physical Therapy and Sports, EvolvePT.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Back to the Jim's Firearms Hotline, Denton Day, college football overtime on Sirius XM. Usually Jones is on Mondays, had some priors, so he jumps aboard a little bit late here on a Tuesday to talk some CFB. Denton, how we doing? Hunt, what's up, man? It's a good day to uh, uh, talk college football. We got the rankings coming out tonight, and that's the only important thing that's happening this evening, right? Um, depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more fun than the politics, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be locked into that to see how things uh, kind of shake out. Let's talk about some of the teams that lost on Saturday first before we get into the rankings and what we're going to see this coming weekend. Uh, Penn State uh, takes their first loss of the season. Rinse and repeat. They can't score any points on Ohio State and can't make the plays when they have to. Um, anything to chew on with Penn State there? It's just the same old, same old. It's the same old, same old. Years they have no quarterback, they have good receivers. Years they have a quarterback, they have no good receivers. Like, it's this weird circle of life that is the James Franklin experience. Unfortunate, it would have been a lot of fun, chaotic if they won. You know, giving Ohio State two losses in the beginning of November, something we don't see often. Even with the 12-team playoff, it kind of puts a lot more pressure on Ryan Day in Ohio State. But that's not what happens because James Franklin can't win in, in big games. It's a him problem. If you don't agree with that, I, 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 you're blind at this point. Nothing's going to change, though. They're not going to fire him. Uh, he's 1-10 in 10 against Ohio State. They're the B rival of Ohio State, so it doesn't really matter. And it's, they'll probably get into the college football playoff, all things considered, and their fan base will be somewhat happy. So, rinse and repeat. It's, um, it's interesting with Penn State, though, because you've got a consistent product that is good. It's not elite, and they're not winning championships. And there's no guarantee that if you move on from him, you're going to get the next guy. You could fall off a cliff like Tennessee did for a decade and a half, or you could fire Mark Rick and hire Kirby Smart. I think it's more likely you fall off a cliff, but where what would you do if you were uh, Tennessee administration? I mean, you got to keep them. you Because you're right. There's a much bigger likelihood that you either become Tennessee, Florida, Nebraska, USC. I mean, there's so many more examples of teams that kind of outthink what they are. You know, you're still getting 10 wins a year yeah. if you're Penn State, especially with a 12 team playoff. You're still at least putting yourself in position to at least make something happen. Are you going to this year? No. Next year, probably not. But you're still in that position. You're still getting a lot of money because of that. It's much more dangerous to fire him for the young hot shot or whoever 
that you have your eye on because the risk of falling off a cliff is far, far more likely than you getting a Kirby Smart, like you had mentioned. So I, you got to keep him, but it is like we're going to be making these jokes until he finally does it on a consistent basis. I was pretty shocked at Clemson's loss. They lose by double figures to Louisville. I realize you got a block field goal run back and it, or some freak, freakish things. You only gave up 156 yards passing. But um, what, what does that loss mean for Clemson? It's an embarrassing loss. And I think it really calls into question the potential of the ACC getting two teams in. I still think there's an avenue in which Clemson beats Miami. They win the ACC championship. They get in, and then Miami gets in as a one-loss team. But you and I had this conversation last week. How many teams in the ACC are going to get there? We were under the impression that it was going to be a one-loss Clemson versus an unbeaten Miami. Now that it's not, like a two-loss Clemson that would potentially lose a, a third game in the ACC championship, they're not getting in. So that really kind of opens the door for teams in the SEC. But this was a bad loss for Clemson. You, sh- you have been putting up all these points. You would have people saying that Cade Klubnik should be in the Heisman conversation. And then you play a team like Louisville that a couple weeks ago surrendered all of these points to Miami and you can't do anything with it. That's a bad loss by Dabo. It's a bad loss by Clemson. Especially at home. Clemson now 5-1 and one, uh, in league play. Speaking of that league, uh, Pitt takes its first loss of the season. SMU looks really good in that game. Are they a threat to make the playoff? I think they are. I think we are now kind of transitioning, or at least I am transitioning to the potential of seeing SMU and Miami in the ACC championship game. Not quite as sexy, I think, as Miami and Clemson, but the way that SMU handled Pitt this weekend was incredibly impressive. They have shown when they're in when they're in big slots, because remember, they were in a couple of big slots in the beginning of the season. When they're in big slots, they tend to step up. So I think they're a legitimate threat. It'd be really cool for a team like SMU, who uh, didn't get a New Year's Six game last year, transitions to a Power Four conference, and then wins that Power Four conference in the first year, potentially. That would be a hell of a story to write. No question about it. Uh, were you surprised that A&M got beat by three scores? By three scores, yes. The fact that they lost, not really. You know, I think we all kind of realize this is a trap game. This is not going to go well for Texas A&M. But the fact they got beat by three scores, you know, South Carolina is a good team. They're not a, they're not a beating the only unbeaten team in the SEC in November by three scores. Good. So that was incredibly surprising that that they did not have the ability to carry over any of the momentum it felt like from that LSU win. I guess it is more of the same with Texas A&M. They're not there yet. And maybe it was unfair to think that they were going to be there yet in Mike Elko's first year when he didn't really have his selection at quarterback. But three losses, I mean, eesh, that's not that's not a good look. Uh, let's talk um, about the playoff selection committee uh, and what they'll reveal tonight. Is there anything that, that has your interest with the rankings tonight? You know, I'm curious to see what they're going to do with some of the one-loss teams and, and how they – Like, is Ohio State going to, as a one-loss team, rank higher than Indiana, who's in the same conference but has not lost? I would say yes, because Ohio State is a better, more talented team than Indiana. But it's going to be unique to see in a 12-team playoff how uh, almost liberal they get and wishy-washy they get with some of those things that it felt like they were super strict on in years prior because you only had so many slots. So I'm I'm intrigued to see how that's going to look. And then just to see how many Big Ten teams how many SEC teams, and then what they really feel about teams uh, like Notre Dame or maybe teams in the ACC. Do they feel good about SMU? Like, is SMU going to be in that top 12? Because a couple weeks ago on one of their their mock rankings shows they had two ACC teams in there with Clemson and Miami. So it'll be unique to see how they view things in this new model. And then that's kind of what we're going to use as our blueprint for what this first actual 12-team playoff is going to look like. It's uh, it's fascinating. I, I don't put really any stock at all into what they do tonight, but I, I am curious to see just kind of what it looks like uh, on the screen because we're used to just the top four mattering, and now you're looking at at uh, one through fifteen or eighteen really being relevant. So it's there's more to chew on, even if it's not of, su- of a ton of substance the first week in in November. There'll be some substance in the SEC this week. Let's start in Oxford, Mississippi, where Georgia will travel to play Ole Miss. Dogs laying two and a half, although. They haven't looked like world beaters the last couple of weeks. How do you see that one? Yeah, that's a short line. Like that's that's a much shorter line than I thought it was going to be. And I know they're they're on the road, but while they haven't looked like world beaters, we have seen Ole Miss when they play good teams, they don't exactly look great themselves. So I think this is really a testament to how wrong certain people uh, were about Carson Beck, not 
me. I don't think you were wrong about him either. This is kind of what I expected when he didn't have this amazing defense to bail him out. He is an average quarterback, it looks like. So I think that's really what that's pointing to. And Jackson Dart, well, I don't think he's amazing. He's better than average. That is the one thing that Ole Miss has that Georgia does not. I still see Georgia winning this one, but I was a little surprised this morning when I was looking at these lines and seeing that one as short as it is. Yeah, Jackson Dart, 21 touchdowns, three interceptions on the year. Carson Beck, massive interception problems uh, himself. All right, let's talk about the one here in Baton Rouge, 630 LSU and Alabama. Neither team in the top 10, but still a lot on the line because the loser gets their third loss and probably a ticket out of the playoffs. The winner right in the mix in the middle of November. Alabama's a three-point favorite in Death Valley. I was Yeah, uh, th- this is obviously the big one. Uh, I'm excited about this one. What is Jalen Milrow going to look like in a big game? You know, he, he had that fourth and 31 last year in the Iron Bowl, which was awesome. But what is he going to look like? Because he has been a guy that a lot of people had expectations for, and he has not lived up to that. I do think Alabama has a slight edge just because of some of the talent they have. But I think this one's going to be a good one. I Baton Rouge and Death Valley is different when it comes to some of these places in college football. It's them and then everybody else in terms of hostile environments. So I am very curious to see how a guy like Jalen Milrow is going to be able to handle that. I like LSU in this one, if I'm being honest. That's not just because I'm on with you on every week yeah. in Baton Rouge, but I, I do like LSU because I don't know that, that 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 environment is going to be tough, I think, for a guy like Jalen Milrow to overcome. And I'll be a happy guy doing the postgame show if that is the case. And when doing the postgame <laughs> show, I'll be watching BYU and Utah, the late-night game, that now all of a sudden has a little bit of relevance uh, potentially to LSU. I think the Big 12 is a one-bid league, and if it is, then we don't have to worry about this. But BYU is unbeaten. They are ranked uh, They are ranked number 9. They're 8-0. and And they play Utah uh, in, in the Holy War there at, uh, in Utah. I realize it's a U, uh, it's a 4-4 a four and four Utah team, but do you give them any chance against their rivals? And what's a 3.5-point spread, 8-0 versus 4-4? Four and four? Yeah, I do give them a chance just because it's a rivalry game. I would think that there is still some sort of potential that the Big 12 gets two teams in, but I don't think the Big 12 and the ACC do. The, you know, there's something about this Colorado team. Remember yeah. when we were all uh, gagging about them last year because they got too much coverage? Well, now they actually kind of deserve it. So that's a team that I'm like, you ask about what I'm looking for tonight. I'm curious to see how the committee feels about them, knowing that there is a route for Colorado to get in there. I think BYU gets it done, but this. This is the one that I would that I had had circled and said this is the one I'm nervous about in terms of them running the table and going unbeaten because the, the rivalry game, the holy war, it's a different feel to it. Uh, so I'm I would love Utah to win to be honest. It'd be, I, I want the madness, like I really want the madness. So I'd love Utah to win, but I do think BYU. I mean, they got a lot of short spreads this year and they have blown teams out of the water. So I think I would trust them over that. We'll see. Denton Day, college football, uh, Sirius XM, college football overtime. Joins us every Monday. Made a little adjustment here, but we'll be back on uh, schedule next week. And uh, Enjoy the selection show tonight, Denton. Thanks, man. I will. I will. And thank you for Marshawn Lattimore. Appreciate it, guys. You got it. Marshawn Lattimore headed up to Washington to play some defense. Unless his hamstring um, doesn't cooperate, which generally tends to be the case. I've got a small feeling that hamstring Probably feels a little bit better today, headed to Washington than it did getting ready to go to practice in New Orleans. But that's just a guess on my part. No, no way to know. Uh, Thirty-two minutes left in the uh, before the uh, NFL trade deadline. We'll see if anything breaks uh, with Chase Young or Carl Granderson over the next uh, thirty minutes or so. When we come back, Sharif Ishak covering the Saints, WDSU down in New Orleans. He's next. The Hunt Palmer Show. Genesis of Baton Rouge. Genesis of Baton Rouge dot com. If you don't like going to car dealerships to buy a car, that's okay. You don't have to do that. The Genesis of Baton Rouge. I highly recommend you do that. This is an amazing facility and their brand ambassadors are great to work with. It's a fantastic experience. But if you don't have time or don't have the interest, then just give them a call. They can have one of their brand ambassadors drive to you and do that test drive at your work. They can do that test drive at home. They can do e-contracts. They've got digital delivery and they don't need you to set foot in the car dealership to purchase a new Genesis. And if you do that, you get 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty. You're not going to beat that. It's a luxury car brand. It's a luxury experience to drive a Genesis. They're sleek. They are stylish. They are safe. When I say safe, it's backed up by awards. The IIHA top safety picks. Some of the line were top safety picks plus, but everyone of the line at Genesis of Baton Rouge was given that IIHA top safety pick. Just give it a shot. If you've never given a thought to a Genesis, 
Just give them a shot when you're in the market for a new automobile. It's Genesis of Baton Rouge. Every car on the lot online at genesisofbatonrouge.com. Genesisofbatonrouge.com. You're listening to The Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Congratulations to Andy Antley from Youngsville. Andy is the Week 10 winner in our 2024 Pick'em Contest and wins a Hooters Wing Party for 10 people. Don't forget to make your picks for Round 11 by Thursday, this Thursday at noon. Weekly winners will receive a Hooters Wing Party for 10 people, and the first-place season-long champion will receive a 75-inch 4K flat-screen TV and soundbar, plus free Hooters Wings for an entire year. It's a 2024 College Football Pick'em presented by Hooters. All right, Shreve Hashtag, WDSU down in New Orleans, joins us every Tuesday, does so now on the Jim's Farms Hotline. Sharif, how we doing? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. I'm glad to hear that. All right, uh, let's go chronologically here because there's a lot of news to get to since we last spoke. So let's start uh, back on Sunday. Uh, the Saints go up to Carolina, play the worst organization in the league, and can't win the game. Uh, let's start there, and then we'll get to everything that happened after it. But what did you see on the field? How jarring was that performance? Um, I saw some absolutely boneheaded play calls there from Clint Kubiak and Dennis Allen because he has to take some of the accountability, and obviously he did on Monday. Uh, you're, you're just running the ball nonstop with Alvin and, and Taysom Hill, and you decide that let's be cute and start throwing the football all of a sudden. Uh, yeah. I really thought the players tried hard for the most part. I, they had a lot of good effort in the game. Um, the fourth and one, stupid. Fourth and four, even dumber. So that's what I think about anything when it comes to that game. I, I blame it all on play calling, not effort on the players. And obviously it showed on Monday morning. Did you know when the result was a loss to Carolina that this was coming? Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. I'm surprised it didn't happen the night of, okay. to be honest with you. But I think they just said, let's wait till the next day. And, you know, I, I think the decision was made after the game that night. And and then, and boom, it happened Monday morning. I was not shocked at all. Uh, shocked that they did it, like, middle of the season. Because I thought he was going to get fired once the season was over. But uh, at the same time, not shocked. They had to do it because I think you started seeing Twitter – uh, with Cam Jordan apologizing, Colin Saunders saying things that he was saying, even though I think he's just a funny Twitter follower. But then you also see Cam Jordan, that video of him walking off the field, uh, turning off to, and not going into the into the locker room and having to be have Alvin Kamara and Derek Carr go get him to come back. He's that visibly frustrated with how things have gone. Uh, then you hear Alvin Kamara after the game saying, we have confidence in our players, something else. I mean, you start hearing that. Gail Benson had to do something. I mean, and, and, and they did it. I mean, it was the right move, I think. And not I think, I know. But, Hunt, you know what I'm going to say. It's bigger than Dennis Allen. Yeah, I, I want to spend one more on Dennis Allen, and then we'll get to, to what, where we go from here and then the Marshawn Lattimore news and what else may happen in the next uh, next 25 minutes. But um, you're hearing reports of, quote-unquote, lost the locker room. Um, they've obviously lost seven games in a row now. Um, is it just a seven week thing? Does this go back to the Falcons game last year with yep. the post game deal? Is this all the yep. way back to his time as a defensive coordinator? Like what is, what's, what is ultimately this all rooted in? Uh, well, I think the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was 100% this past game, but it all, the beginning of the, all, the beginning of the end all started with that Falcons game. James Hurst, he, he works with us now. He's our analyst. I, Fletcher posted the sound bite. You want to go listen to what he said, but he said, yeah. It was that Falcons game, how he never pretty much didn't have our back and apologized. And that really, you know, upset a lot of the players off, upset a lot of the players. And it, you know, and even the next day they were still upset about it. And then I think they held the grudge against, you know, Dennis Allen apologizing to Arthur Smith after that game. And he said he was fine with them, like him, them being reprimanded in the locker room. But publicly, it just was a bad look for him to apologize to the Falcons. And that was the beginning and the end. And I think. It was good for James Hurst to come out and say that publicly because no one has said it up to this point. None of the players, no one has actually said it within an organization. That's where it all began. Today, you see they move on from Marshawn Lattimore. Um, does that signal that they're going to just go all the way to the studs with this thing the best that they can? 
Uh, the best that they can. Uh, I think that's the best asset they have that they could trade. I think they got pretty decent value, a third and a fourth. Yeah. Uh, for a pro bowler, you know, who's mysteriously going to be like healthy by the time the, Red, the, the commanders play again the next game. I'm sure he'll be just fine with his hamstring. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought it was a, you know, it had to do what you have to do. I mean, I, I don't know how much they have left in terms of trading within the next 20, 25 minutes. But, I mean, I think he's the only asset that can get you something of value right now. Unless were, you really, like, had a healthy Chris Olave, and you're like, all right, let's move off of Chris Olave. But then you're really, really tearing it down if you're getting rid of guys on rookie contracts. Yeah, I mean, the the two guys that have come up on Twitter have been Carl Granderson uh, and then Chase Young, who's on a one-year deal. Um, if you were Mickey Loomis, would you attempt to get rid of those guys as well? Uh, I, I would think his post yesterday probably... Um, didn't make a lot of people happy in the front office whenever he posted that picture saying how I'm walking into work today and you had like a smiley face after Dennis got fired. I'm sure some people might not like it within even the locker room and even in the front office, but almost he's too much of a, uh, Hey, they just gave him a new contract and he's almost like a valuable part of their defensive line. Then you're really, really just destroying your, your, your team for at least a year or two, which I think I'm fine. I'm fine if you want to get rid of somebody who's an asset and get draft picks for it. And but I think it would take something nice in order to get some uh, to trade off of um, Carl Granderson at this point. And I, I just don't know if any teams are going to be willing to offer that what second round pick maybe and like a fifth or a fourth. I, I just don't see it. Chase Young, maybe they're just, they don't have any takers. I just don't see him going anywhere. I just think that they're not getting what they want for Chase Young and just going to you know finish out the year with Chase on on this you know bad team. And look, if, if Chase Young finishes out and has a productive uh, last few games, which he's paying, playing for a contract, so it's not like, oh, well, the Saints aren't going to win anything. Why would he try? Well, he's, he's playing for his next deal to whoever's going to pay him that. And so if he is productive, you could potentially get a compensatory pick if he moves on, um, and that could be a third rounder. So it wouldn't be a shocker if Chase Young didn't go if they don't get something in the neighborhood of a, a third or fourth round pick. So um, I, I think it's... It's interesting, but to me, it feels like there's a complete shift in, in direction of the franchise. What can they accomplish over the last, what is it, seven, eight weeks of the season? Um, I'm sure the fans don't want them to win. That's the one thing they don't want to do. They don't want to you know, miss out on a higher draft pick. But uh, to be honest with you, Hunt, I mean, I guess they want to play for Darren Rizzi. They love Darren Rizzi. I, I think they are going to try to you know, win games, as many games as possible. But you have to remember, this team is still beat up. This team is still injured. I mean, they got injuries all over the place right now. I mean, they don't have any receivers. And they don't have, like, now they don't lost the cornerback. I don't even know, is Kool-Aid McKinstry going to be healthy enough to play this weekend? It's like, outside of Alante Taylor, who else is playing? I mean, Jamar Gene Charles. And, I mean, you get back maybe someone else to play. I mean, Rico Payton. I mean, they're just running out of players at this point. I mean, I understand they want to play for Rizzi because Rizzi has that passion, has that energy, and he's a good leader. He really is. I mean, he's man, he's got that bravado. But I mean, what do they do? Four and four, three and five, finish six wins, five six wins, and pick in the top ten. I mean, this really. I mean, they're playing pretty much for themselves at this point. I mean, you know how the fans feel. The fans just have had enough. For sure. Uh, so, what's uh, do you have a name or two in mind for a new head coach? Do you have a, a, a personality, a, a specialty on one side of the ball? Like, what do you think is next for the next head coach of the Saints? Uh, I mean, you, the, the odds are out there. You see, Ben Johnson is on the top of that board. Aaron Glenn, obviously, Aaron Glenn was a secondary coach here with Sean Payton now in Detroit with uh, Dan Campbell. I mean, Dan Campbell has Ben Johnson as his offense coordinator. He passed on the Panthers' job last year. Smart move because. Not only the worst, you know, organization in football, it might be the worst organization of all in sports. You don't want to be there with Tepper. I mean, I think that was a smart move not to go work for, for Tepper. I think that that's a disaster over there. And maybe Dan Campbell's like, hey, Ben, Gale's a good owner. Go there. They have good stability. You might have to work through it like I did in Detroit. Everyone said, I should not take this job in Detroit because Detroit's a disaster of a franchise. And look, here they are, Super Bowl favorites in the NFC, like back-to-back years. So, it's going to be a little bit of rebuilding. It's going to be a few years. And maybe Dan does convince Ben to take the job here in New Orleans because of the stability they have at ownership. So maybe I, that he is at the top of my board. I think they need to go offensive minded. The league is, is pretty much an offensive league. Um, I'll give you another name outside of the top, those top two names. Maybe Cliff Kingsbury 
uh, maybe Slowick, offensive coordinator for the Houston Texans, uh, Liam Cohen, offensive coordinator for the Bucks. I mean, the sleeper would be bringing Mike McCarthy back to New Orleans. He was here from 2000 to 2004. It feels like he's going to get fired once the season is going to be over, unless Jerry Jones gives him another season because of injuries. But, I mean, those are some of the names. If you want to go defense, I mean, Vrabel, Mike Vrabel again. Yeah. And if you want to go defensive-minded. I mean, look, here's another name, Todd Munkin, or offensive coordinator for the Ravens. I'm just thinking offense. I've just – I've seen it enough. I've seen the defensive coaches. Unless you're bringing like these amazing stats and you're getting a high draft pick like Dan Quinn got in Jaden Daniels and was able to get Cliff Kingsbury to make it work, yeah. But it's 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 you know how how rare is that going to happen for you? It's not a good track. It's not a good class of quarterbacks. Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough spot the Saints are in. We'll see how they start to navigate it. But Marshawn Lattimore will not be a part of it. He is now headed to Washington. Uh, Sharif, briefly, uh, the Pelicans, most banged up team in the NBA. Uh, Guess that's not really super great news. Uh, what do you make of their first uh, first three weeks? Are they practicing on airline drive? Yes. Like everybody thinks. Okay. Yeah, they are the most banged up team in the entire NBA. I mean, you have Zion out, Trey out, CJ out, Dejounte out, Herb out. I mean, am I missing somebody? Brandon Ingram's the only person who's actually playing. I mean, yeah. everybody, your starting lineup is hurt. It's unreal how much production's on the bench. Give them, uh, uh, give them credit for like you know having guys like Brandon Boston, Jose Alvarado, Brandon Ingram has been amazing. But they just keep running out of juice at the end of games because they have no one to play. I mean, it's they they all five of the losses about fifteen or more points this year. I mean, it's just bad, and they all come against well, the two of them against Portland. I mean, God, some of these losses have been against some some bad teams like the Hawks and Portland twice. I mean, the Warriors are good. I mean. I mean, they're six and one, but man, just looking at these injuries, I, I, I'm I'm a little worried about this Zion thing not being at the game yesterday. Him, Willie Green, say that you know they kept it at home, and the doctors wanted them to stay at home. It's not contagious. This isn't a virus. Yeah, the hamstring quad. I mean, uh, something has to be up, uh, and I can't believe we're Groundhog Day once again saying something has to be up, something's wrong. I mean, I don't know, man. It's a long season. Yeah, it's but, it's uh, uh, not a great start, man. I yeah, mean, it's so, not. I mean, don't be surprised, man. They got rid of Dennis Allen. Things continue to go south later during the season. Just saying, especially when they're healthy. I guess we'll uh, we'll cross that bridge if we uh, if we get to it. Sharif, appreciate the time, man. We'll talk next week. Listen, man, I'm sorry about all the negativity <laughs> the last seven weeks, but you know, I don't know what else we're supposed to whenever. say. Well, I'm not I'm not sure with, if you're if the team captains and leaders are being negative, your 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 news and reporters are all going to be negative. There's nothing positive to say. Sorry. Nope, not really. We'll do it again next week. Thanks, man. All right, man. Go Tigers. That's it. Sharif Ashak, WDSU down there in New Orleans. There's not a lot of positivity. Uh, the Saints are starting a rebuild from the bottom, and the, Pan- the uh, Pelicans don't have any players. So it's just a tough uh, tough scene down there with 5 4 Come back, play some take it or leave it, and that'll be it for us on a Tuesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Highland Insurance Group. HighlandIG.com is the website. They can help you with property and casualty insurance for your business center. They can also help you with group and employee benefits. They can be your one-stop insurance shop. Jonathan Carbo is a great dude and an awesome insurance broker. I've had a chance to talk insurance with, with him uh, multiple times here. And I, you know, I, I spoke this language for seven years. And you know, there are some people that they get it and some people that just don't. And Jonathan and his team do. And they understand that not everyone does. So you, you should trust your insurance broker and be able to trust your insurance broker to get you in the right position when that incident happens, whether it's a hurricane, car accident, cyber breach, lawsuit, whatever the case may be, you need to be protected. And Jonathan Carbo and his team can help you with that. Employment practices, liability, directors and officers, insurance, crime, cyber, umbrella, whatever the case may be, they can help you with all of it at the Highland Insurance Group. Check them out online, highlandig.com. I say this all the time. If you're just looking to call an insurance broker, hey, can you save me 20% on this? In this marketplace in the insurance world right now, that's just not a realistic possibility, but it is realistic to make sure that you're properly covered at the right price. And they can help you with that at the Highland Insurance Group. HighlandIG.com, HighlandIG.com. This is the Hunt Palmer Show, brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar.
104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge is your new home for the New Orleans Pelicans. Tomorrow night, the Pelicans host the Cleveland Cavaliers. Hopefully, they'll have a few players back from injury, but that tip-off is set for 7 p.m. right here on 104.5 ESPN Baton Rouge. Tuesday show is brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. Two locations in Baton Rouge. Nicholson just south of campus. Blue Bonnet in front of the mall of Louisiana. We'll be there tonight for Sports Trivia. 8.30, drinking cold beer, eating some delicious wings, watching some football, watching some basketball as well. Grab a teammate uh, or group friends or just come out by yourself, win some gift cards, enjoy Tuesday night. We always enjoy our time at Pluckers. They bring you our Tuesday shows each and every wing. Pluckers, if you don't like our wings, we'll give you the bird. All right, Mac, take it or leave it. Oh, all right. I was about to say, did we get a yeah. new tape to leave it song? No, nope, no, we did not. I just uh, pressed uh, the wrong button there. Uh, for, all right. First one here asked if a Thursday night game feels like cramming for a test. Former LSU wide receiver, uh, current Bengal Jamar Chase said, quote, I didn't study in school. <laughs> Go Tigers. Take it or leave it. <laughs> I'll take it. Look, I'll I take think it. the purpose of going to school is to make sure you set yourself up for a career. Yep. And Jamar set himself up for a great career. He's he's he was he got a great job right out of school. He did, uh, and he's gonna you know, get a raise here uh, very shortly. Most likely, so, yes. Uh, I think that that's all well and good. I think he did a great job academically at LSU by uh, winning the Blitnikoff Award. Yep, that was really all he was here to do. Yep. But shout out Cardell Jones. I'm not here to play school. That is very true. Next one here, late night election coverage. Take it or leave it? I mean, that kind of depends on how you're asking. Uh, I, I will take it. I will be watching. Um, I'll take it. I have said this a lot of times on the airwaves. I am shocked at the way our politics are covered. Uh, it, it really blows my mind. I am not incredibly informed on all things foreign policy and how different taxes affect this and that and like i'm not i'm not i don't have a great political acumen i'm i'm reasonably informed as compared to the entirety of the electorate but what i do a significant amount of time is watch fox news for 25 30 minutes and watch msnbc right after that for 20 to 25 minutes and i'm just blown away at the way that these networks cover politics it's, um, I mean, essentially, it's like if I just got on here for an hour straight every day and just told you how atrocious Alabama was at everything that they do. That's what, that's what they do. I, I, my wife doesn't ever watch politics. For like 20 minutes last night for each network we watched, and she was like, I can't believe this. Like, they only talk bad about the Democrats and they only talk bad about the problems. Like, yeah, this is all they do the entire time. And that's, I'm sure, what they're going to do again tonight. And it's like, you can turn on Fox and you can do Laura Ingram and Sean Hannity and uh, you can hear uh, Jesse Waters. You can go to MSNBC and hear Maddow and Joy Reid and uh, Lawrence, like all those guys. And, and it, they just, I can't believe, no one ever gives a dissenting opinion on the entire set. It, it, it blows my mind. It's like a journalism guy who went to school for it. I'm amazed, but I guess that's what people want to hear. So it's what they do. I'll watch both of them, and I'll probably just be more like blown away by the actual coverage than the result of whatever happens tonight all across uh, the country. And then, of course, here. Here's my uh, my advice to you, the uh, listener. Tune in to Brian Haldane on we'll Talk 107.3 from 8 to 10 tonight once the poll's closed. He'll have actual, real, realistic coverage. Although I am uh, impressed with Kornacki working the, the screen. He yeah, like knows yeah. all the counties and like all, and he can work all the buttons and like he's really good at that. Just the the actual commentators, I think, on both networks. I just I can't take anything they say seriously because they only talk on one angle. I can't. How am I supposed to? You have no credibility if you only talk one way. Yep, that's very true. All right, last one, real quick. Tredavious White is headed to Baltimore from L.A. The Rams are uh, fire, fire sale is on. Take yeah. it or leave it. I'll take it. I'll uh, take he it. Just. Weird career for Chad. Yeah, um, yeah. He's made some money. He had some really good moments early. A lot of injuries. A lot of different teams yep. now. Um, but he's hung like around. He's still serviceable. Yeah, I mean, as long as you can hang around, that's the deal. Like I hear Hester talk about it all the time. It's like you know, it, it gets taken away really quick, and it hasn't gotten taken away from Tredavious. So he's going to a great organization. I will be candid. I'm not really pulling for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're in, in my you know diehard Bengals fan of course, division. Of course. But uh, yeah, pulling for Shaq, Shreveport guy, and a great Tiger. So good for him. Hang around. Get some cash. Just don't beat the Bengals.
That's it for a Tuesday edition of the Hunt Palmer Show here. Uh, if you missed any of it, catch it on demand, 1045ESPN.com's on demand tab, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you find your sound. Glenn West talking football in the first hour. Mark Etheridge talking some LSU baseball. He watched 21 innings back in Biloxi on Sunday. Had some basketball in hour number one as well. Denton Day talking national college football perspective at 215 and Sharif on the disasters in New Orleans. Matt's about to drive you home with all the latest news from the Saints on AFR. We're back tomorrow, same time, same place. Hope to see you tonight at Pluckers, Hunt Palmer Show. The Hunt Palmer Show. Boudreaux's Electrical Services. We're looking at the tropical storm in November at this point. So you really have a lot of months out of the year where you've got to concern yourself with storms in this part of the world. And the best way to prepare yourself is to get that home standby generator. Generac from the folks at Boudreaux's Electrical Services. Every single Generac generator from the folks at Boudreaux's Electrical comes with a 7 to 10 year warranty. So one, you got the peace of mind of knowing that your power is not going to go out because you have the generator. Two, you've got even more peace of mind because you know you've got a warranty on that piece of equipment for 7 to 10 years depending on the generator that you select. You're never going to hear me talk about VIP memberships or additional charges you got to pay to Boudreaux's to get quality customer service. That's just part of the deal with the folks at Boudreaux's Electrical. Give them a call at 985-397-1562 or 225-300-9389. You can check them out online at Boudreaux's Electrical.com. It's my friends at Boudreaux's Electrical, Boudreaux's Electrical.com.